Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. I got a call from someone at night, and this person called me and said, I have a friend, he's a little inebriated, he has lost, he is running from um, uh, he, um, a crime family, and he's scared, and can you talk to him about, about Jesus? Would you tell him how to go to heaven? I don't know how I can't, would you do it? I said, bring him by. It was late one night, about 10.30 at night. The guy comes over, he brings his friend, his friend is strong, you know, kind of built like me, no, kind of, kind of big, big and strong. Not real inebriated, but he goes into the story and saying, I used to be in Vietnam, I've got so many personal combat kills where I kill people with a, with a wire thing. And he said, um, I then got involved with a, a, a group of people that were selling and doing drugs. I got involved with the hit guys who were a part of this. He said, I never killed anybody, but I was with them when it was being done and they were being brutalized, blah, blah, blah. He said, then I realized I don't want that life. I couldn't get out of it. So I left Philadelphia. I headed down to uh, Dallas. They were waiting for me. My parents said there were people out in front, uh, black cars, all the stuff you see on movies. And so they said, so I, he said, I came down here with my girlfriend down to South Florida and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping underneath this, this fishing pier and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, let me, t- let me tell you, you know, you can, you can have everlasting life. And then he went ballistic. He pulls up his t- t-shirt and in the belt is a loaded gun and he takes his gun out and he holds it to my head with the other friend over here his eyeballs you know big like saucers and he says I'll kill anybody who turns my brother on to drugs and I said don't worry I'm not gonna do any of that and I said don't re- relax I, I said it seems to me that you don't have any peace right now and he said no I don't have any peace I said if I could share with you how you re- can have real peace genuine real authentic peace that will never go away would you like to know how and he said, yes, I would. And I said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pick up a Bible. And I had an old Gideon's Bible on my desk. And he took his gun and he laid it on my desk, but within, you know, grabbing distance. All right. And so I carefully went through Scripture and I showed him that we are justified by faith. And when we are, we have the peace of God. And we can have that peace. And he said, do you mean the only thing I need to do is to trust Christ as my Savior and I can have everlasting life? I said, yep. And he says to the guy who brought him, he says, is what that guy said right there true? And that other guy, all he did was this because he was still so scared. He went, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I said, are you ready? He said, ready. So he got an old football type huddle there. And this guy poured out his heart. I'm a sinner. Basically, I need a savior. I'm trusting Christ as my savior. So at the end of all of this, he said, I don't need this gun any longer. I, I'm so filled knowing that I have a relationship with the Lord. I have all of this. So he ejected the shell, took out the clip, left it on my desk. And I said, well, if you're giving me that, I'd like to give you a knife. And he said, really? And I said, yes. So I took my Bible and I said, this is my knife. I want to give you this knife, which was the Gideon Bible. So I handed the Bible to him. I wrote John 3.16 in it and my phone number and name. And I gave it to him. A week later, his girlfriend called and said, Max has so much peace. Can you give me this peace too? I want that peace as well. Would you come over to our apartment and talk to me? And I I didn't want to because, I don't know, it was a set up crime people. (laughs) Maybe I'm chicken. I don't know. I said, no, you come to my office. I did. (laughs) I said, you come to my office. And so I, Carol, called her up. She came into the office because I don't want to be there with this woman. She came in. If we're going to die, die together. No, I'm just joking. So I said, come on in. So we went through with that Gideon Bible led her to Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain why I told you those two stories. Jesus Christ today is the same as he was then. Then as he is today. I am no super soul winner. All I knew was this. It doesn't matter their background, whether they're religious or criminals. I know that the power is in God's word And each one of them have their own special needs, particularly Max, who needed peace. So I went from something that was known to something that was unknown a little bit to him. Peace is something he knows, but how can you have the peace of God? And we talked a little about something that would be so important to him, but in a relational way. And so I had the gun. He had the gospel. And today he probably still has that old Gideon Bible that was given to him back in the 70s. So I'm telling you, you don't have to be anything special. 
You just allow the Lord who lives inside of you as a Christian to look out over the people, whatever their ethnic background is, whatever their gender is, whatever their, their high, low, famous, infamous, you give them the gospel. Now when I say that, let me give you one thing that might be a caution. This is Ponzism. It might be wrapped up with some discernment, I hope. I, I, I'm uncomfortable sharing this with you because I don't know exactly how I fall on either side of this. So I'm, I'm burying my soul. How much evangelism can a man do with a woman or a young girl? All I can tell you is that there's a slippery slope thing going on right there. In Scripture, it talks about being discerning. Be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So I want you to know, you men that are out there, I hope you're not into girl evangelism. But at the same time, should that happen, you do it. And here's my example. I know Jesus was perfect. I realize that. I know he could not sin, but Jesus might have modeled that there are times that you do speak to a woman, but you do not carry on, watch this, a discipleship long-term relationship with him. All of Jesus' disciples in his band of brothers were guys. And so I would just simply say that when God brings that person to you, realize that you are in a very serious situation that Satan could easily use to turn it away from something good and quickly go south into something bad. But at the same time, don't neglect to give them the gospel. Just remember that the temptation is there, but you have the Holy Spirit for strength. So do it right and do it cleanly. Do it publicly, not privately late at night in the backseat of your car. I think enough has been said. I'll let the Holy Spirit tell you where we're going with that. Well, now I appeal to the mind that I'm just about out of time here and I'm only on number two. But um, let me see if I can do another couple minutes and then wrap this up. My goodness, this is terrible. A little bit of time. He now moves from the heart and he now moves into the mind. Pick it up at verse 10 now here. Pick it up at verse 10. Well, verse, maybe verse 9 is better. He says here, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask for me a, a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That means they won't even eat out of the same cup so they'll look at them. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In your Bible, underline the word if you knew. That's the mind part. If you really intellectually knew what was going on, if you fully understood what's happening right here, you'd look at this thing a little bit different. So he applies, he appeals to the mind a little bit as he goes through this to let him know. So when you do this, communicating the gospel, you're going to go from the unknown to the known. You're going to notice that she asks questions through this. Drop down, if you will. I think you have your Bible there. Look in verse 11. And she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? That's question number two, because he asked further on, if you knew this, why did you do this? Then he says here, You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us a, uh, the well and drank of it himself and his, and his sons and his cattle? Don't you know this? Question number two. So my point is simply this. Jesus is there. This lady now begins to make statements that are like statements with a question. And notice what he does. He allows her to ask questions. So here's the lesson we can learn from that. When you engage someone, it's not a monologue into their brain. It's a dialogue to get into their heart, to find out what's on their heart, what are they thinking, what kind of reasoning do I need to change, what kind of questions do they have that are not really important questions, so I'm going to just kind of let them fly by. I'm not going to grab a hold of every question they ask. I want to find out what's genuine or what question, watch this, watch this, watch this, that really needs to be answered in order to go to the next level. So allow them to ask questions. Now here's our problem. It's mine too, but I think I have the solution. The problem is... If I engaged with these people, whatever religion or cult they might have, they might ask me a question I don't know the answer to. What do I do then? You write the question down, you get their name and phone number, and then you call Pastor Dennis or Pastor Charlie about 2 in the morning, because that's when they're home, and you ask them that question. No, I'm joking. What you do, then you, you then find the answer. You, if they asked you a question, it's never a sin for you to be asked any question about the Bible you don't know the answer to the first time. After that, then you got a problem because God's kind of shaking your... So now, what do we do here at church? We provide classes for you. We have a tremendous library upstairs with 3,000 theology books to help you. We've got people on our staff, volunteers that are here to come alongside you. We will do whatever we can to give you the answers so that you can go back to those people, whatever they might throw at you. 
Now that being said, let me tell you, it generally boils down to only four or five questions that generally they'll ask you. Where did Cain get his wife? All that kind of stuff. They never ask you, did Adam have a belly button because he didn't have a mother? I've never asked that question, but that is a question, isn't it? Talk about that on the way home, figure out what your answer is. Number three here, it says, refuse to be drawn into an argument. You might say, how did you get this out of that, Pastor? I, I, it's very easy. Do you remember what she said here? She says, Jacob, my father. Well, in reality, Jacob wasn't the Samaritan's father because, in a sense, they're all mixed blood. The Jews really could say, Jacob and all these patriarchs, they're mine. They come, they're, that's our heritage. You got all that, that, that heathen stuff with you thrown in with a little bit of Jewish stuff in there. So it's really not the same. And, and even when you come up against a Jewish man or a Jewish teacher and you make a statement like that, it's so easy then to shut them down because look at what you believe. That's wrong thinking. You know what Jesus does? He ignores it. You know why? Listen, why did he ignore it? It is not part of the dialogue that's necessary to know in order to have eternal life. Maybe later on you can talk about it, give them some truths later on, but right now that's not the real issue. So he wasn't drawn into an argument, but he does deal with her desire. Heart, mind, desire. Look at verses 13 through 15. And here's what you read. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again meaning the water that's in the bucket that's in the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. If it's your Bible, underline those three words. Shall never thirst. And then circle the word never. Never, never, ever, never, ever, ever, never, 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 ever, ever thirst. But the water that I'll give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now for her, she probably would have to say Shazam. Man, that means I don't have to come here with my water pot every day. How do I get that kind of... And of course, she goes into all of that. So her desire was, uh, I want to take care of some physical stuff. And Jesus is saying, I want to change your desire. Watch this. As much as you want the things of the world or the basic needs of life, listen, listen, the most important things are the, are the basic things of spiritual life, which is salvation. What I just said, I carefully chose every word. There's a lot of spiritual stuff that we need to know, and that's great to know. But the basic thing we need to know first is that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, and that it's living water that you'll never thirst again, that once you have eternal life, you don't have to keep it. God keeps it. It is there forever and ever and ever. So God says, it's not about your basic needs now. It is about your basic spiritual needs right now. Now, water is important. That is a basic need of life. But right now, that does not trump your spiritual needs. And so I would hope we would understand that. Well, I put a couple of things down here. Look at the picture. He says you will never thirst. Write it in your notes, if you will. It flows constantly. That means the eternal life, the Spirit of God, it flows constantly. Now, while you're writing down here, never thirst and flows constantly, I'm going to give you some background. I don't have time to unpack all of this, but Jewish people that were properly taught knew about living water. The Old Testament and many Old Testament prophets would refer to God the source of salvation in the metaphor of living water. He did it once and again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. So when Jesus is referring to the living water, that's why when you read, when he says, you drink out of these old cisterns, what they're really doing is drinking out of the world, drinking out of things that will never satisfy you. And he says, no, the living water is the Lord. And of course he's referring to himself now. Now we're seeing him crank it up a notch. I'm not just my humanity now, now I'm my deity. All right, so it constantly flows. He says it's a spring of water, which means it's fresh. It's fresh water. It's a well. That means that it's eternal. It comes inside. It's not something that's external. And finally, it's eternal life, which means it flows forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Once you drink of it, you will never thirst again. How many of you ever lost your glasses or your keys or better yet, your remote? Would you raise your hand? Have you ever done that? Now... Um, they have special stuff for remotes. And I have a neat phone. My, my iPhone has one of those find phone or find your phone thing. So if you can't find it, you're supposed to do something and it'll find your phone for you. But that's the part I don't know. But I know it's supposed to find my phone. But I can tell you this, that if I'm looking for my phone, I know it has all that gadget. I am smart enough to know, borrow Carol's phone and call me. Then it'll ring somewhere and I'll hear it. How many of you have done that? Okay, you know it. I've done that. All right. Now when I do that and I find my phone, I don't say, hey, Carol, I found my phone. Let's keep looking. I don't do that. You Why? Because I found my phone. And so once you find Christ, you find Christ. Now here's the big thing with me. And I know about apostasy and all that stuff, but I'm wondering how many people have said, oh, he was a Christian, now he's this cult, or he was a Christian, now he's into that kind of isms or spasms out there. I don't know that they were a genuine Christian. Because if they really were, they will never thirst for all that stuff out there. 
Now, I'm not going to doubt everybody's salvation that says that, but I really do question it a little bit that they might not have really trusted Christ. Because once you trusted Him, man, I'm telling you, you don't look for any more. Now you just want to go deep, watch it, you want to go deeper into that spring of living water. You want to really drink and get all that you can. Not so you keep it because, but because it's so sweet and refreshing. Here's the last appeal. Heart, mind, desire, and conscience. And he said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have said it correctly. You have no husband for you've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now you're saying, well, what's that deal with the, the, the conscience part over here? Actually, in the Greek where it says, I have no husband, is actually a word that's translated into just three words. It would be as if she's speaking pidgin. Because it goes like this, I know husband, I know husband. I mean, she doesn't have a husband. And so what she's really saying is, I, I, I'm out of order here. I have no husband. Now, I don't have time, but if you look at how much this woman, she's a real motor mouth. She rattles through all of this stuff with Jesus. And then finally, when Jesus says, where's your husband? Go get your husband. She reduces it to four little English words. I have no husband. And here's how I think of that. Generally, when we're guilty... When we're authentically and we own our guilt, not when we're guilty and we try to justify, because when we justify our guilt, we talk even more to try to cover it up. But when you're genuinely owning your guilt, you say as little as possible, yeah, I did that. I, I did that. Yeah, I, I, I did that. And Jesus did that with them. Now, here's what I want to end with on this, and then we're done. <clears throat> Show me in this passage where Jesus says, oh, you want the living water? Get rid of the guy you're living with. He never said that. All he did was to use that sin to bring her to a point of brokenness so that she then would ask more questions, but now her questions were focused on the gospel where he now can actually drill down so she can come to know Christ as Savior. Here's the warning for us. Do not front load the gospel message by telling people to turn or burn in order to trust Christ. They don't have to make something in order to trust Christ. They don't have to give up something in order to come to Christ. They come to Christ just as they are. Now that doesn't mean that God says, oh, just go ahead, keep on sinning as long as you trust Christ. What he is doing is he says, I'm going to catch the fish before I start cleaning it. He says, the first thing I need to do is give him the plan of salvation because here's why. Now, theologically, don't, don't listen to these Bible guys out there that they take one verse out of context, but go to the theology of this. Jesus says we're dead in trespasses and sins. That means a dead man can't dance. So a dead man can't do anything to start this or stop that. So the only thing he can do as a dead person is look to Christ, the living water, the bread, the one who will regenerate them. And by faith alone now they have eternal life. Now what happens is the power of God through the Holy Spirit comes into that person. They're no longer dead. They're now alive with that sin, but sin forgiven. They now have the opportunity to clean up their life afterwards because now they have the power to do that. And watch this. They have a sanctified mind that now knows the word better, can understand what to do, when to do, what is really right, what is wrong, what's my motive, why should I, how can I do this? I want to live for him. So keep these things in mind. So watch this. We don't front load the gospel by telling people to be good to get saved. And we don't back load the gospel by saying, we trust Christ, but now you better do these things or you kind of lost it. Or you do these things to prove that you really got it. We do these things not to stay saved, not to get saved, but because we are saved. And so when I look at this lesson, it's, a, it's, it's about talking to this woman at the well and how loving Jesus was and he crossed all these barriers. But he's really teaching us how to connect to a lost culture today that's very much like this culture. Ethnically different, relationally different, morally different, economically different, but all the same. Dead in trespasses and sins. And we who know Christ as Savior, He lives within us, and so now what can we do? Take our time and our compassion, come alongside them, and by grace alone, teach them that going to heaven is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you for letting me have this time with you today to share the beauty of God's Word. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this, this, this Bible event that we just read about today, it's in your Bible. And since it's in your Bible, the Lord meant it for you. And He meant it for me too, We're, for all of us. But for right now, I want to really just 
come alongside you and just say, own this, my friend. Whether you're listening while you're driving down the highway, whether you're listening at home, whether you pick this up on the computer, you're jogging because you put it on your MP3, whether you're here in our, our sanctuary, own this. Will you do this? Jesus said this to this woman. Jesus went there and divine inspiration said, I want it recorded forever and ever and ever. And so, yes, it's to show that Jesus Christ, He is humanity. He was thirsty and He wanted a drink. He was God because He knew this woman already was a sinner and where she had sinned and how desperately He knew she needed a Savior. And that's why He said over and over again in the book of John, Gospel of John, Truly, truly, I say unto you, He that believes on Me has everlasting life. Now, for those of you that are on the other side of all of this, would you now come to the Lord? Now, you might have come to Him and you've heard all these Bible truths and you're bringing your own little thoughts. You think it's just take care of this life here and you want this and this and that. You want Him to be your, your genie God. You rub the bottle and he pops. I don't know, but you've got to see Him. He is the Lord and He says, that's not your basic need. Your basic need is a spiritual need that when you die, there's no hope if you don't trust me. And so will you trust him? You do not know when you're going to die. We've heard a, an armada of motorcycles go by a few minutes ago. How many people have died in bicycles and motorcycles just this year on our island? I wish that upon no one. And of course, no injuries. But those people who died, if they thought they would have died that day on that motorcycle, they had never hopped on and roared off. You do not know. Would you right now call upon the Lord to be your Savior? It's not really a prayer. It's just a... A transaction where you're finally coming to him saying, Lord, I'm lost. I need you. You died. You rose again. I'm trusting you. I'm thanking you for what you've already done. I am claiming you as my own Savior because you're already the Lord. I want to thank you for that. Is there anyone in here today that would like to let me know that you're doing that in a moment? I'm not talking about those who've done it before, but today's the day. I'd like to pray for you. Let me remind you, walking an aisle, coming forward, raising a hand, me praying for you, saves no one. It's believing in Jesus Christ alone. And so I want to just pray for you as a new friend, a new, perhaps a brother or sister in Christ, because you trusted Christ. I'm not saying you're the woman at the well, but you might be. I'm not saying you're Nicodemus, who's religious and wealthy. I'm just saying you're just another human being for whom Jesus died and rose again, who's calling you right now, who, who came because he had to, to you today. Would you trust Christ as your Savior? With every, every head bowed, every eye closed, you want me to pray for you. Would you slip up your hand if today is the day you're trusting Christ? Anyone at all? Put up your hand. Put up your hand. Let me see it real high. Okay, Christians, how many of you believe in your heart that you saw Jesus in just one more color into this beautiful palette of technicolor of how he would relate, relate to someone who is so different? And now you, like Jesus, are willing to connect to those that are so different than you might be. That might even be against what you might be. But yet you want to love them to Christ. And you'd like to have prayer because you know that you need to have your eyes to go out rather than ingrown eyeballs. And you're going to take this summer and you're going to use it when you're at the beach and begin to just strike up a conversation and see where it goes and talk about some earthly things and you move it into something spiritual and then you end with salvation. So you go from secular, spiritual to salvation. And you'd like for me to pray for you. Because you know you're going to step out a little bit more with the boldness of Christ, not your own. And you'd like for me to pray for you as you want to reach them, starting with their heart, then with their mind, then with their desires, and then maybe lovingly, gently with their conscience. Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all? Oh, amen. Amen. My hand is up too. I, I, I preach this stuff, but I get more convicted because I spend so much time preparing for this. Now next week, I pray you're back again because we're going to talk about how she responded to all of this. She didn't just jump into the gospel. There's more going on in this wonderful event and I want you to be here for that. Bring your Bibles with you. Bring your friends with you. Let's learn together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. I thank you that you chose out of all the things you've done, there's so many miracles, so much stuff you did, the Bible says that you didn't have it all recorded because there's just too much. But you chose this one to be in Scripture. This woman, this real live woman who was born of a mother innocently. And she grew up to be this kind of a woman who needed the gospel. And help us, Father, just like Jesus, to not look at a person's skin, 
and sin. Let's help look at that person's heart that needs Christ and reach them for you. Thank you for the one who did that with us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.